because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The word of God for the people of God. design um, so I never knew like with intros like how much to tell people so I'm just gonna do a quick like speed dating type thing so I'm just gonna spout off a bunch of facts about me and that will give you kind of an idea um, so like I said studying to be a graphic designer I'm not sure I want to be a graphic designer but you know I'm a junior so we'll see uh. <laughs> I am a preacher's kid big thing for me um, I finally come to terms with the fact that I'm an introvert who does not like to be lonely. I'm a walking contradiction. Um, I have a very dry sense of humor, uh, frequently handing out sarcastic comments. Thank you for anybody who got that Friends reference. If you didn't, you need to watch more Friends. Um, so, I am an ENFP on the Myers-Briggs test. Um, the E stands for empathy, and I scored a 99% for empathy. So when I feel things, I feel them hard, and I will easily cry at the drop of a hat. So bear with me. I've never given this story before, so I might cry tonight. Just fair warning. Um, what else is there? Oh, some of my favorite things are my family, my boyfriend Luke, my cat Mabel. If any of you have not seen pictures of her, I'll hook you up. She's my favorite thing on the planet. <laughs> um, and yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Um, so now I feel like I need to explain why I'm up here. Um, so like I said earlier, I'm a preacher's kid, which my dad is the greatest human being I've ever met in my life. So he's getting a little nervous when I say this. But for me, being a preacher's kid was always one of those things that like was weird about myself. Um, it felt like I was very obligated to like know my faith, know exactly what theologies were, and to be like an expert, being willing to come up here. Um, but I've always felt that I was more lost than some people. Um, that general like knowledge never really came super easily to me. Um, so, for example, growing up, I had a friend named Gracie in like middle school. She was telling me, "Oh man, I went to church camp and I was saved." And she was out in the middle of a lake in a canoe and God came down to her and she heard the angels sing and he told her how much he loved her and that she was saved. So she turned to me and she goes, so Chandler, like, what's your story? Like, how are you saved? And I go, ah, I'm a pastor's kid. Like, that's it. That's all I got. Um, so yeah, I was very confident in that. Um, but I never really felt like I had a story. I never really felt like there was anything I could give to people that I kind of I was born, I love Jesus, and here I am. That's pretty much what everything was for me. Um, but today I decided I am up here because I'm going to tell you my story, what I feel like my testimony is. Um, so yeah, never told a story before. Not a really happy story, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so my story, I think, goes back farther than this. I think things work in your life way earlier than you ever notice. Um, but I'm going to start freshman year of college, got here, was excited as crap. Like, I am extremely independent, I love being a part of groups, I love being a leader in communities. Um, so like college was like the thing, like I was so ready, I was a freaking second or second grader praying about college and how excited I was for it. Um, and so I never really liked school. I don't like homework and like the work school requires, but I like being in a community, so I was really excited for it. Um, but about halfway through my second semester, 
I experienced what now I know to be like a panic attack slash anxiety attack, I guess it was, um, out of the blue. Um, I was a little stressed, like of course it's second semester, midterm, sophomore year, or freshman year, not really used to it. Um, but this was the most like couldn't breathe, like debilitating like moment I'd ever had. And I didn't really understand it. So I just kind of labeled it as, oh, I was stressed. Like, that's fine. Like, we can move on from this. It's okay. So I carried on with the rest of the year, and it was fine. Um, flash forward to sophomore year. I'm taking 16 credit hours. I'm working 35 hours at PetSmart. I'm still active in all these clubs. I'm trying to become a leader. I'm getting more on campus jobs. Um, and the thing I think that scares me the most about this time in my life is I don't, I cannot tell you when it happened. I can't tell you at what point things turn. I can't tell you like some great event because that it just doesn't exist. I think the way mental health and mental illness works is there's no like trigger to it most of the time. It's just, it comes and it goes. Um, so early September, the only way I can explain it is I woke up and I couldn't get out of bed. Like every single thing that was expected of me felt like a chore. I was extremely lonely. I was picking fights with Luke all the time. I was kind of isolating myself, which I already have a tendency to do because I'm an introvert. Um, so I would just, I would go through days like I was in a fog. Like I wouldn't really know. I wouldn't remember anything really. I wasn't paying attention. And then I would get home and I would lay down and that's when it would hit me. Every night for months, I would have these like anxiety attacks where I thought I was going to suffocate myself from crying so hard and like just freaking out. Um, so eventually, like it usually does, if you have any form of anxiety, which I don't like mentioning it because I think I have a tendency to say like, oh, I have like pretty bad anxiety, but like it's different for every single person. There's no way to like gauge it or label it. It's different for everybody. Um, so that, for me, eventually turned into what I would call depression. Um, I continue to not want to do anything. Um, so this, it lasted for literal months, from September to probably February. It was just my life was this feeling, not being able to do things, but still trying to pretend. Um, so while all that was going on, I fell from God hard. Um, and it was so unbelievably frustrating to me because I would think, like, why are you letting this happen? Like, what did I do to, like, have to be put in this mindset? Um, told you. Knew it happened. <laughs> um, but I would just lay there and I would think, I was so happy. And then now, a year later, I'm in this state. And it was just, it was like I was drowning. Um, so... I wish I could tell you that there's this like big heroic climax where oh this God came in and like saved the day and I just woke up and I knew that I was fine. Um, that's just not how mental illness works, unfortunately. Um, but after a lot of convincing from Luke and my family and my friends, I like finally I came out to my family and said this is what's been going on. I've been hiding it forever. Um, and I eventually went and talked to someone. Um, but even after, it was like what I assume a really bad hangover is, where you wake up and you're just like, you don't even know like how to go on for a second. Like you still feel so tired and like you're scared and you don't trust yourself because like, what if it happens, it comes on faster than it went away. Like how am I going to prevent this? Um, so basically what I was left at is what now? I knew how to talk myself down from things. I knew when I like could notice that it was going to happen. But I felt like I had all these pieces around me that I needed to pick up and put back together. Um, so before I continue with any of that, that's kind of like my testimony. That's what I was dealing with. Um, but I kind of wanted to go to the scripture and explain like why I picked it, why I chose it. Um, because I identify extremely with the Israelites in the story. 
Um, like I said, I'm really dramatic, and so I think this kind of shows, like, the Israelites are known for kind of, like, freaking out when they don't really need to. Um, yeah, they got a lot of problems. Um, but, so it starts, it says, As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us to Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So already, that is literally how I approach situations. It's like, why is this better? Like, clearly this is not going to work out. Um, and so Moses answered, which Moses has always impressed me. He was always the calm, like, rock of the situation. Um, he says, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So I think we can all agree that we all have our own personal Egyptians, those things, whether they're in the distance, on the other side of the sea, whether real close, they're just those things that want to wreck your day so bad and you know what they are and you just can't really stop them. Um, and I think another reason this script passage in particular was something that I looked over a lot because immediately after this he parts the freaking seas and like that's the climax of this story. But the thing that stopped me, which I had to read this passage for my religion class, um, was it says, Moses says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now the word fight is what got me. Being still is not my specialty. I'm not good at sitting still and waiting for things. But I always thought God is this all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing being. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows why things are happening. It never, I always thought he was just kind of like passively, like, oh, yeah, the guy and sheep, like, oh, it's okay, like, they'll get there eventually. But it never occurred to me that he was fighting for us, like actively, like, taking on our demons and doing it for us when we couldn't. Um, and I think in this stage of our lives, we're really expected to do everything and be good at everything we're doing. Um, so we have to maintain grades, we have to go to church, Bible study, be president of clubs, like work jobs. Um, and I think especially what happened with, to me was I lost sight of all of that. Like in the midst of everything that I was having to do, it was like I went blind. And like I couldn't find God anywhere in it. And like when you feel like that alone, like even God can't get to you, it's just like the most horrifying thing. Um, so you're probably, I don't know if anybody saw the title of this. Um, I titled it, you know that song by the Black Eyed Peas? It's called Meet Me Halfway. I don't think anybody knows they sing it, but it's, it's like Fergie's like real powerful in the beginning and they sing about Meet Me Halfway. And so partly I chose because I like to be clever. But I, partly, but I mainly chose it because in those nights where I was having those moments and I was freaking out, I was just like, I was literally negotiating with God. And I was like, okay, dude, if you can meet me halfway, like, I'll go to church today. If I can skip Bible study on Wednesday, like, just work with me here. Um, I don't know if anybody else does that. I feel like I'm negotiating with God all the time. Um, but it wasn't until recently that I realized, like, he's going to meet you wherever you're at. Like, if you can only give 92%, he'll meet you the other eight. If you can only give 2%, which is what I felt like every day, he will meet you exactly there. He will give all 98. He'll give all 100 if he has to. Um, and I just, it occurred to me that, like, I would think, like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Like, what does this all matter? And then I thought, God chose me. God said in every combination of a human being he could see, he said, I want her. I want her to be here. I want her to do this. And he did that for everybody. Like, how, I know it's a cliche, but, like, how mind-blowing is that? That out of every possible person that could have existed, he chose you. And I just, that was like the thing that I was like, I got it, like, I got to fix this. Um, so yeah, I wish I had some kind of conclusion to this story, this big story that I've been waiting my whole life to tell. 
Um, but I think the thing with these stories is there never really is an ending. Like even now I've been studying, I've been reading the Bible and I'm still working on it. Like I'm still working on myself and my faith. Um, and sometimes I honestly feel like I have no idea what's going on. But even when we're out there dealing with all those Egyptians that we just really can't handle. Um, I just think whether I know you or not, like, like I'm like, let's share our stories. Like, let's do it together. Like, let's deal with it. Um, cause I think the happy ending in general to these stories is God is so dang good. Like he, oh man. <laughs> um, yeah, he's just so good. Like, he's going to do everything he has to for you. Okay. I think I'm almost done. But, <laughs> oh, man. I just want to say you are so loved and redeemed by his love. And that's it.